Thank you for listening to this week's message from Go Church. We hope it encourages you today. For more information about Go Church, check us out online at letsgo.church. We hope you enjoy today's message. To be honest with you, I haven't always loved Easter. Honesty check. Now, I grew up in church, and my mom and dad, they're wonderful, wonderful people. And I'm sure they're watching today. Nothing but love for you, Mama. Nothing but love for you. But listen, when I was a little kid, don't tell her, but when I was a little kid, my mom, for some reason, on Easter, always wanted to dress me up like a little investment banker from, like, New York. I mean, like, she wanted to bust out the stiff shirt. She wanted to bust out the tight, scratchy pants, the little glossy black shoes that, for some reason, were too small. It's like trying to get an extra year out of them when I was a kid. And God forbid the tie. I saw a couple of you with ties today. Can we just give it up for people with ties? Come on. they can. I see you back there looking good. God forbid the ties. So listen, I got nothing but love for all the kids in the house, all the kids over and go kids who have the tight shirt, the scratchy pants, the tight shoes. And by kids, I mean all the husbands in the house. Listen, all the husbands, you're here. Man, you had a plan. You got up and you were like, I'm going to wear my soft tee. I got my favorite fit for Easter. And you got it on and your wife was like, Mm -mm. Not today, buddy. Go back to the closet, get the pastel, get the collar, get all of that. We're taking pictures. We got brunch after. Get the jacket. You had to dust off the jacket shoulders and put it back on. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. I'm excited about it. Easter, man, love changes everything. The power of God, life of God is what Easter is all about. So I'm excited today, but I want to give you a little sneak preview of what we're going to do next Sunday. This is something that we're going to start. It's a new series. It's a package of teachings called Habits of a Healthy Heart. We're going to talk about habits and some spiritual disciplines that are going to really make a difference in your life. I want to give you a sneak preview. Here are some of the topics that we are going to hit starting next Sunday in the series. The habit of self-examination, looking on the inside before we look to the outside. The habit of simplicity. Sometimes you can do more with less, the habit of solitude, and we are going to say, yes, it's even possible if you have children to have moments of solitude. We're going to help find it. And then the last habit that I am excited about that I have heard many people in Go Church just mention this dynamic, man, if I could just slow down. Life seems to be so fast. If I could just figure out how to slow down. So we're going to close the thing with the habit of slowing down and talk about Sabbath living and finding some peace in the middle of the crazy chaos that is life sometimes. It's going to be so good. So listen, sometimes in Easter, you know, you're visiting. Maybe you're here with somebody that you love, and I'm so glad you're here. Maybe you haven't been here in a while. Sometimes our culture is like, I come to Easter, and then I'll bounce. I am challenging you to give us, give God, give each other, give yourself four weeks. Four weeks. Come four weeks in a row, get in the middle of this series, and I promise you God's going to do something powerful in your life. I double dog dare you to go four weeks. Everybody say four. Four weeks. Now, I love Easter. I got up this morning, walked outside, had my coffee. I was standing in the walking path, had a great view of the sun, not even up yet, just kind of peeking, you know, just a little bit of preview of what the sun's going to do. And it was just a perfect sunrise, man. And I was thinking, I wonder what it was like. I wonder what it was like for the women who went to the tomb. And of course, the tomb was empty. What it was like seeing him maybe in the early sun, a little mist from the morning. I thought all the way back to when I recorded an Easter Sunday message in the middle of a dark time that we don't like to remember called COVID. I went out to a field by myself in the early morning, and I preached this message, and the sun came up behind me, and it was so cold. I remember seeing my breath and just feeling and wondering what it would be like to go all the way back and to be one of the characters in the Bible, to see him with your own eyes. I don't even know how I would respond, but could you just think about that for a minute? Think about if you were one of the disciples. What if you were one of the men and women that were alive when Jesus was alive, and then dead, and then alive again. It would have been an amazing experience. 
I love Easter, man. Without Easter, we don't have a purpose. Without Easter, we can pack it up and go home. The resurrection, the life of Jesus is everything. And I'm so excited to get into this message today. But as I was up early looking at the sunrise, my mind went back. You see, sometimes the light is the brightest if you have just come through something dark and hard. Never is a light brighter, ask my teenagers, than when the bedroom light is flipped on in the morning. It is like the sun in your room. But sometimes in life, the same thing is true. Sometimes it's hard to see the light because it's so dark or you feel so far away from God or it's a dark place. So some people on Easter, I'm very sensitive. Easter is great. Things are great. Work is great. Kids are doing good. Everybody's loving Jesus. But that's not everybody in this room. I promise you. I know that there are people in this room, personal stories and names that I can share with you that are going through a challenging time. The job thing didn't work out right going through the middle of a really hard divorce, trying to get back into dating world, figuring out kids stuff, money stuff. Sometimes the light is brightest when you come through a dark time. What if this Easter for some of us is a bit of a, of a dark time? If you're feeling that way, or if you feel like you've been in a season like this at all, I want you to know that you're not alone that a lot of us Jesus followers have been in a place that could be described as a dark night of the soul, could be described as a challenging, almost godless feeling season. Like, where is he? I was thinking about that this morning as the sun was rising up. I went back to one of the darkest, hardest times of my life. I'm just going to be real with you. One of the darkest, hardest times of my life was when my wife and I found out that our firstborn kiddo, Sydney, that she was born with special needs, born different, born with a chromosomal abnormality. It was so rare, they didn't even have a name for it. So they just called it what it was, 2Q37 deletion syndrome. And we didn't know what to expect. We didn't see this coming. This was devastating news. This is our first kid. And it just takes you a while to believe that this is happening, that this is real, that it's not just a messed up test or the result was wrong. So we're going forward, going forward. They tell us to go see a doctor in New Orleans. We were living in Baton Rouge at the time. So we go to this doctor in New Orleans, and this doctor, his name was Dr. Superno. I kid you not. It was like a villain off a James Bond movie. Go see Dr. Superno. So we go to see him, and what little hope I had, I was thinking, well, maybe she'll be different, sure, but maybe in a positive way, or, or maybe there'll be things that she could do that, that other people can't do. And, and whatever little optimism I had, he crushed in that meeting. He was like, she will not walk you need to get your mind ready for her not to walk, not to talk, not to go to school. She, she might be nonverbal. And I'm like trying to find some, some optimism. I'm like, you know, well, maybe could it be this way? And, you know, could we? He's like, no, you got to get that out of your mind. This is serious. This is going to change your life. He literally said she's going to be writing the book as you go along. So you're going to have to learn how to be in real time. Well, I don't have a binder. I don't have a brochure to give you. Her, her syndrome's not normal. And it was dark. And at that time, I was a professional pastor. You know, I had credentials, baby. I was ministering to college students. We had a good thriving ministry and staff. But I'm telling you in that moment, you see, it got real and it got personal. And it's easy to have theology when it's not personal. It's easy to say, oh, yeah, everybody has hard times and everybody goes through difficult seasons until you have one. 
It feels different than it does in academia. And so I was bumping up against that whole truth that I believed. I'm like, man, all-powerful God, he can do anything, but there's sickness and there's pain. You see, I knew what to believe, but when you feel it, it's just different because we're human. And I got mad at God. I was just mad. I'm like, here I am, I'm over here, I'm trying to preach the gospel, trying to build your kingdom, trying to do all this stuff. Why my daughter? Why my family? And then I started asking the question, why me? Yeah, you better believe I asked that question. What did I do wrong? So there were times in my life when my relationship with God went a little bit silent, hidden, dark, frustrated. So to those of you who have been through a season like that, or maybe going through something difficult today, this is a non-traditional Easter message coming right to you. Maybe you're in this place, and you came with somebody that you love, and you're sitting here, and you're thinking, I don't think I even believe that God exists anymore. I'm just here to play nice, because I love some folks in this room. Maybe you're not here by accident. Maybe God wants to do something powerful in your life. And it brings us to the one big thing that I want you to write down on your communication card. Take it, flip it over onto this side, and write this right across the top. We're going to give you a couple of things to think about today, a couple of things to take home. Here's the first one. Even when you don't believe in God, write this down. Even when you don't believe in God, God believes in you. Even when you don't believe in God, God believes in you. So many times in church, so many times in theology, so many times in conversation, the question is, what do you believe? Do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in this make-believe, hocusy-pocusy thing called Christianity? What do you believe? Do you believe in this or not? But we never really turn this around and say, well, what does God believe? You better believe that God loved you before you loved him. The Bible says that even while we were sinners, even while we were messed up, even when we were living a selfish life, even when we were in a dark place saying, I don't want to have anything to do with you, God sent his one and only son to give his life for us, even in the middle of our sin. You see, God went first. God loved you before you loved him. God believed in you before you believed in him. In fact, God loves you even if you don't love him. God believes in you if you don't even believe he exists. What does God think about you on this Easter Sunday? Think back about Jesus' life. Jesus was born. Jesus grew up. We don't know a lot about these years of young all the way to about 30. When he's about 30 years of age, he goes into full-time ministry, and he calls certain guys to follow him. The Bible calls these guys the disciples. You see, Jesus didn't do changing the world by developing a lot of documents that he was going to later upload in the cloud. He didn't leave three-ring binders of things to teach. He didn't break out new technology and record himself preaching, make sure and propagate this throughout the known land. He trusted his entire life, his entire ministry, his entire message to who? Humans. How crazy is that? Have you met yourself? We're crazy. We're not very dependable. <laughs> we could be all over the place. His entire life, his entire ministry, he, he took all of that and entrusted it to his followers. See, Jesus ministered to many, but he mentored a few. And of those few, he spent all of his time. So imagine how close he got with his disciples. I mean, you know how your relationship can change if you just go on a long road trip with somebody. They can really change. Uh, for the worse <laughs> or for the better. But you never go on a long road trip with somebody without discovering a lot you didn't know. Habits, do they drool when they sleep? Body odors that happen sometimes on road trips. What do they like to eat? Do they pee every two minutes? 
Imagine these guys are together all the time, every day, 365 for three plus years. All of that time. Imagine the conversations, the humor, the stories. Them there when Jesus was doing ministry. And of those disciples, there was one that was super close. His name is Peter. And in the very beginning of the relationship between Jesus and Peter, Jesus says this to Peter. This is in Matthew chapter 16. Check this out. Jesus says this to Peter. Imagine that you're Peter. Jesus says, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. On this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The gates of hell will not prevail over it. Imagine you're Peter. How awesome does this feel? Whoa. So I got a job. I'm going to be used to do something. This is amazing. Out of all the guys, Jesus singles out Peter. It says, you're the rock, man. You're the rock. Jesus and Peter, I think, and his disciples, as close as you can get. Peter was there when Jesus healed the blind man. Peter was there when Jesus multiplied loaves and fishes. Peter was there when Jesus walked on the water. Uh, Peter was really there when Jesus walked on the water. So there he got wet himself. Peter was there when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He was there when the paralytic was lowered down. He was there to hear Jesus talk back and forth to the Pharisees and talk about how hypocrisy hurts the heart of God. Peter was there for all of this. Three years plus. But Peter was also there when Jesus was taken away, arrested, and started walking those final steps towards the ultimate sacrifice of him giving his life on the cross. See, Peter was there in that moment when that group came to arrest him. That night when he was betrayed by Judas, a Judas kiss on the cheek. This is what happened. This is Simon Peter, John chapter 18. This is when Jesus was arrested. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, Peter was packing. He was packing heat, man. This Simon Peter who had a sword, which is weird to me that he had a sword. He drew it and he struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think that he was aiming for the ear? I don't think so. I think he was aiming for the head. And the guy moved and he got the ear. Peter is coming to blows. He cuts off his right ear. There are other biblical records that say Jesus picked up the ear and he healed the guy. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup my father has given me? Which harkens back to a moment that happened probably just hours before where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. You see, we can't have Easter without Friday. We can't have Easter without death. We can't have Easter and resurrection without sacrifice, without punishment, without giving of one's life. Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was asking his father three times, is there any way that this cup can pass from me? This cup of suffering, this cup of death, this cup of separation, because he knew that he was going to bear the sin of humanity for all time. He knew this. And then Jesus said, yet nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. What a selfless, amazing, incomprehensible act of love. And then fast forward in time, guess what? Peter is in a sense getting in the way of this happening. Jesus is saying, don't stop this. Don't tempt me to go a different direction. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has for me to drink? So they arrest Jesus. And the men, I want you to hear this. The men, 
that spent all of that time with him, all the travel, sleeping together, eating together, all the campfires, all the miracles, all the times, all of the teachings, all of the ministry, when they took Jesus, his most needy time, what did they do? They ran away. They deserted him. And while they hid, Jesus suffered. We have to get in our mind what Jesus went through to truly appreciate Easter. For truly he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. All. Jesus was taken away. He was rested. He was tried. A bit of a mock trial. He was taken away. And he began to be abused and beaten by the Roman soldiers. It started early and it started hard. These were hardened soldiers who knew how to bring pain and suffering. They were beating him in the face, beating him in the body. What gets me the most is mocking him, saying things like, oh, you're a prophet? Oh, you're a prophet? Guess who punched you? Guess who struck you? Ha, ha, ha. Oh, you don't look so fancy. Let's put a fancy robe on you and dress you up like a king. You're the king of the Jews, right? Strike. Maybe the king of the Jews needs a crown. Oh, let's get him a crown. Weaving together a crown of thorns. Not something small and dainty, but something like this. Not just set on the head. Beat into the head. Jesus taking it. Taking it. He goes from something like that to almost an unbearable and unthinkable act of punishment. The scourging, the whipping, this Roman act. The Romans were so good at inflicting punishment. They'd honed it. So the whipping that we read about in Scripture would have been done by a Roman instrument called the cat of nine tails. They would have tied Jesus most likely naked to a short post and strapped his arms around exposing his back. And this whip is not just some light single-stranded whip. We're talking about something called the cat of nine tails, this heavy Roman instrument of pain where these thick leather pieces would come off of the handle, and then those pieces had interlaced in it pieces of bone and metal. It was meant to not be a glancing blow. It was meant to take and wrap around the victim, to set like a hook, and then rip through. Imagine 39 of those. It's a miracle he even survived. I think it's a bona fide miracle. At the end of that, I believe he would have been unrecognizable. That Parts of his insides would now be on the outside. Ligaments, tendon, his abdomen. His, his, it would have been torn to pieces. And then commanding him to get off of that place and then to take a heavy, rugged, splintery cross and to carry his own instrument of death. They finally take him and then lay him out on this cross, naked, embarrassing suffering and they take big nails and they put them through his wrists and put them through his feet and they hoist him up the bible says cursed is any man who dies by the tree crucifixion was meant to be the most embarrassing horrific death a human could suffer it was a death by suffocation as somebody would hang there their lungs would get constricted and they can't breathe. So they got to pull themselves up to take a breath and collapse back down from being tired. And you do that until you can't do it anymore. But other people had gone through this. Sure, this was brutal. But the most brutal part of all of this 
was what happened spiritually. Jesus taking upon our sin, the sin of all humanity for all time onto himself. Him saying, I am going to pay the price. I am going to receive the full wrath of God's judgment on sin. I'm going to pay that price. In this moment, Jesus turned into the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He became that human sacrifice, paying the once and final price for all of sin. And did you know, when all of this was happening, his disciples, his best friends, they hid. While Jesus was doing all of this, he said amazing words. He turned to a thief on one side, and he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. While he was dying, he was forgiving. The very people that were responsible for putting him where he was, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Even, this is only the Son of God could do this. He breathes his last breath. He says it is finished. They peel his body off of that tree. And while they were doing that, the disciples were hiding. Grab your communication card and write this powerful truth down. While they were hiding, God was providing. You know, even when you're faithless, God's still faithful. Sometimes when we're hiding, God is still at work. Sometimes when we're sleeping, God is working the night shift. Even when we blow it, God's will is still at work. While they were hiding, God was providing. Imagine this. They're hiding in a room, afraid for their lives, afraid at any knock that would happen. They go, no, here they come for us. They're scared to death, afraid that they're going to be taken away themselves. But while they were hiding, God was providing a way to be forgiven. While they were hiding, God was providing a way for reconciliation. While they were hiding, God was making a way not just for them, but also for you and for me. While they were hiding, God was at work. They peeled him off of that tree, and they put him into a tomb. You see, Friday was all about pain and punishment. And Saturday was all about worry and waiting. But then God. Don't you love that word, man? But then God. But then God, on a Sunday morning, through the power of the Holy Spirit, breathed life into Jesus. And Jesus comes back to life. And I look back on the story, man, and it just so screams out loud. The cross could not stop him. The grave could not hold him. He comes up out of this grave, and he is alive. He's changing our lives. I want to tell you this morning that Jesus Christ, man, he did not just create the water. He walked on the water. He didn't just create the tree. He died on the tree. And he didn't just make the stone. He rolled the stone away, and Jesus is alive. Can we make some noise about that, Go Church? Can we have some faith in this place? Can we believe that Jesus can do it in our life? And while all of this is happening, the disciples, they were still hiding. The women, the first evangelists, the women come and they say, Jesus is risen. He's alive. And they don't believe her. I got to go see for myself. Still don't believe. I think this is one of the proofs, just one of the many proofs that Jesus was truly raised from the dead was the skepticism of his own followers. They didn't expect him to come back. When Jesus died, that was it in their mind. Jesus was the message. The message has been killed. We are in fear of our life. We didn't think it was going to come out like this. 
We thought he was the Messiah. The Messiah shouldn't die. They're afraid for their life. They're hiding in these rooms. They get news that the body is missing. They go. They see this empty tomb. They don't really believe. They come back. They're like, what's going on? It wasn't until Jesus appeared to them many times did they believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead. You see, he trusted his entire life, his entire life and death and resurrection to his followers. He believes in you. So what do we do about it? Write this down. It's our one big action. Activate this in your life today. I won't let my past hijack my future. Peter could have done that so easily, allowed his mistake to define him. His denial to define him. Peter the denier could have happened. But instead, he's Peter the rock. Mistakes and all, Peter the rock. My heart goes out to you today as a brother, as a pastor, maybe like me 20 years ago, you're in a season of anger, frustration, unbelief. Maybe you have been hiding for a year or 30. Maybe you used to believe, but somehow justified your way out of belief for whatever modern reason. I've educated myself away from the need of faith. You come up with any reason you want. You got busy. Career got heavy, very demanding. Family, have kids, things happen. But if you were to be honest, you look back and you say, wow, I don't know when was the last time I had a real conversation with my Father God. And silence has defined the relationship. I want to encourage you today Maybe like me 20 years ago, it feels dark, but Easter Sunday is here. Dr. Superno did not know everything. My daughter, Sydney, she graduated from Northfield High School. She can walk, she can run. She doesn't like to, but she can. She loves people, people love her. Jesus loves her, she loves Jesus. Can we just give it up for Sydney? Sydney, we love you in this house. If you give up while it's dark, you've given up. What if Peter would have given up? During the worst part of his life, I said, oh, I don't understand it. Oh, I blew it. Oh, I'm not good enough. God can't use me. God is not sorry for creating you. He's not sorry for creating you the way that he's created you. He's not sorry for the gifts and the talents he's put in you. His giftings are without repentance. He's not sorry. He believes in you and believes that you can take a step today empowered by the Holy Spirit to say, you know what? Today is the day that I am going to believe. I might not understand everything, but I know enough. I'm going to believe. Let's pray. God, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would help every single person in this room, every person watching online, understand their need for you. Holy Spirit, that you would draw every person towards Jesus today, towards the Father today, for forgiveness, for salvation, for relationship. Hear me, Jesus Christ didn't give his life to start a religion. He gave his life and was, was resurrected back to life to start a relationship with you. Do you know him? Or do you just know some things about him? The Bible says that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, if you'll believe in your heart that God raised him back to life, you will be saved. You can start a relationship with Jesus today with a simple prayer of faith. It's that simple and that complex all at the same time. If you're here today and you know it's your time, you've heard enough. You've been hiding, now it's time for you to come out and say, I'm back in the game. I haven't given up on what God's called me to do. If you're here today and you're ready to make Jesus the Lord and the leader of your life, you're ready to submit your life to his, I want you to pray this prayer out loud with me right now. Say, Jesus, thank you for speaking to my heart. 
I ask that you would forgive me of every sin. I am making you the Lord and the leader of my life. And I'm gonna live for you the rest of my days in Jesus' name. Without anybody looking around, I wanna know, you prayed that prayer today, you meant it in your heart. Can I see a courageous hand? And say, that's me. I meant that today and I prayed it and I believe it. Leave them up, I wanna see you. I don't just see you, God sees you. I see you, 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 you too, you, you in the back, you over there, you over here. Come on, God's doing amazing things in this house. Can we put our hands together and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thanks again for listening to this week's message. To stay in the know with Go Church, be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at letsgo.church. You can also download our app from the App Store by searching Go Church. Have a great week and God bless.